Okay, the recorder is on just in case anyone wants to confirm that. And just looking for the right browser to pop up. There we go. Move this to the other side. Okay. Look at that. And so just a quick reminder that we do have homework assignment due on Wednesday. And next Monday is a holiday. Um, I will show you that I, yeah, but I want to show the class that it's not just me <laughs> saying it. <laughs> So you can go to the academic calendar, but I also want to find, you know, what is the reason, right? You know, what excuse do they have this time? Cesar Chavez? Okay. All right, so Cesar Chavez is the reason, and next Monday there's no class, okay? The campus will be closed, um, so we are losing one day, another day of our lecture time. All right, so there we go. Um, so we are getting back to counting, you know, um, we talked about this already last time. We, I used the example of lotto, um, so I just wanted to see if there are any questions about the lotto game or, you know, lotto, um, analysis, that there are close to 300 million, uh, unique tickets. And I think the jackpot just went up to what, 800 million or so? Yeah, so it's close to a billion, 0.8 billion. So I just want to kind of <clears throat> Powerball Lotto. Here we go. Yep, 800 million. <laughs> but we did the calculation, you know, including taxes and other things, you know. Um, I'm not sure whether it's worth it. All right. So do we have any questions about the terms that I talked about on last Wednesday or the concepts that we have already talked about on last Wednesday? Yes, go ahead. It's a, a multiplication of a sequence of numbers. It's kind of like sigma, except this one is for multiplication and not for addition. Okay, all right, so that's a good uh, way to you know, start the class because I can actually um, use the big notation as a starter. I think we have enough you know, concept now that we can talk about the big notations. So we'll, big operators, okay, there we go. It's called big operators. All right, so I'm going to go through this one first, you know, even though it is not directly related to what we are talking about, but I think it is related in a, you know, in a different sense. So we'll start with summation. Um, can the whole class read the formula and everything just fine on the projector? Okay. All right. So uh, in this case, you know, I have a very simple example, you know, where we have sigma, i goes from 2 to 5, and the terms, the sequence of numbers that we are adding is i squared. In other words, you know, what we are actually doing is we are computing each one of these terms, 2 squared, 3 squared, 4 squared, and 5 squared, um, and then we are adding them together. So each individual piece like this one, this one, this one, and this one, it's generated because of this particular thing here, which is i squared. The question is, you know, once we have a sequence of numbers, what do what we want to do with the sequence of numbers? In the case of sigma, we want to perform addition. Um, in the case of pi, we want to do multiplication. So that's basically, you know, what I call the big notation, you know, because, you know, this is for summation, and then we have one for multiplication. In CISP 310, we have one for anding and one for oring, okay? But the concept is kind of the same. Um, 
So the question is, okay, this entire module talks about, you know, so how do we define, how do you make a good definition, you know, using, you know, recursion of summation and the other so-called you know, big, you know, operators. I say big operators simply because, you know, there's an operator here. Just imagine instead of sigma here, we have a big bold face plus sign, okay? That's, that's why it's called a big operator because it is adding a bunch of stuff, okay? But what bunch of stuff are we adding? Well, the bunch of stuff is generated by the iterating through the values. You know, so I is the index variable. It, it's indexing from two to five. And we are using the index to generate the individual values that we are operating on. So that's why it's called a big operator. The question is, how do you explain an op in, you know, the, the sigma notation to somebody else? Well, I just did, right? You know, so what kind of a question is that? Well, the question is, how do you explain this in a very precise manner? In other words, an example is great. I know you guys are smart and you can look at the example and go like, okay, I know, I know what, what that means, okay? But it's not a very you know, official or formal definition, okay? So the question is, how do you make this as formal as possible? Which is kind of what we usually do in mathematics and also in programming. Because every single time you write a program, what you're trying to do is to make something that you know how to do by hand, that you know how to tell somebody else to do it by hand, but you're turning it into very concise and precise description so that the computer can mechanically do that as well. Okay, so we have been doing this sort of thing, you know, for the past few classes that you have been taking already. This is not the first time. It's just that, you know, the mathematical notation is just another programming language, in quotes, that you're learning. But it, in, in essence, it really serves the same purpose. So the way we do this is to say, well, what if the beginning um, index, the beginning value of the sequence is already greater than the end index? In other words, let's say we have i goes from three to one, okay? So in that case, we just, we just say that that is not allowed, okay? You know, if the beginning value of the C sequence is already greater than, they can be equal, but not greater than the ending, then we simply say that there's nothing for me to add. If there's nothing for you to add, then the value by default is the identity of the operator. For sigma, the operator is addition or plus, right? And the identity of addition is zero. Because if you add zero to something, you just get the something back. It does not change the value of whatever you're adding zero to. Is that okay? So that is the key concept. What is the identity? What operator are we talking about? And what is the identity of that operator? So kind of keep that in mind right now. Um, the second case is the easy one, okay? Because you know, what if the beginning value or the beginning the begin of the range and the end of the range are exactly the same? So for, in for instance, what if B and E are both six? I goes from six to six. Then you have exactly one term, okay? F of six is the value of the entire sigma in this case. Does that make sense, okay? And then we have the more general case, which is what if B is just less than E? Well, hmm. So instead of using the example earlier or use the dot, dot, dot notation and leave it to the imagination of the reader, now we actually can define this recursively. So what we do is to say, well, if B is less than E, then the sigma notation of you know, going from I goes from B to E, F of I, we're going to do this. We'll break it up, okay? Because if B is less than E, I can just take F of B out of the sigma notation and go like, I can take care of this one. But there's a bunch of stuff that I don't want to take care of, which is what if I is starting from B plus one to E? That's the rest of the sequence. So I'm just applying the definition recursively and go like, okay, I'm going to let another sigma notation to deal with the rest of this and hence the recursive definition. All right, so are we doing okay so far with the use of a recursive definition? Yeah, I see some people nodding. 
but not everybody. So are there any questions that you want to ask at this point? No specific questions, okay. Does this relate to what you learned or have been learning, depending on whether you're taking 430, CISP 430 in the same semester? Does it kind of jive with some of the other things that you have been learning in CISP 430 in terms of recursion, recursive definitions? This is not coding. This is not C++, right? You know, but the concept is still the same, okay? You just have to say, oh, what if you know, this is not the Greek symbol sigma, and this is not, you know, I equals to B to E. Instead, we have, you know, sigma as the name of a function returning a float or a double, and it has two, you know, um, parameters. One is B and one is E. And then you pass a pointer to a function, okay, you know, or a similar, you know, method, and you just go like, evaluate each one of these things using a function that is also a parameter. You can turn this into C++ notation if you want to. Does that make sense? So it's just a matter of what language are we using, but we're expressing the same thing. In this case, you know, what we're expressing is we are simply saying, uh, if this is the case, I can take care of the first one, and then I will do recursive call, I will use a recursive call to handle the rest of the sequence. What if the rest of the sequence is one of these two? Well, you know, we know how to handle that too, because we just talked about how to handle the, when the recursion is gonna stop. Are we still doing okay so far? All right. So that means, you know, if I want to use the most obscure way to talk about this, I can define the sigma notation using this expression here. I personally really like the use of uh, the ternary operator because it allows you to combine an if then else logic into a single expression. So, you know, and C does support it. So, it is a, I think it's a really cool way to do things. Some people may disagree, but, you know, that's uh, personal. So, do we have any questions about this formula here? You know, the one that my mouse pointer is pointing to. Basically, it is just a much more concise way to talk about things that we have already talked about in the previous parts of this of the same document. We're good so far? Okay, all right. So um, for people who are not very comfortable with recursion, this is an expansion of the recursion. So if we start with, this is just a random example, where i goes from two to five, and the expression that we want to sum is i squared. So you know, for the first iteration, I go like, oh, okay, I can take care of the two. Somebody has to take care of the sigma from three to five. And then that expands to, oh, okay, I can take care of three. Somebody can take care of the sequence from four to five, and then I can take care of the four. Someone can take care of the case from five to five. I can take care of the five. Somebody can take care of the case when it is from six to five. You go like, no, that doesn't make sense. Six is greater than five. You know, there's no sequence anymore. So we return a uh, the identity of addition in this case, and then we have the entire thing expanded. So is that okay? I mean, does everybody understand? You know, the illustration of the recursive application. All right, cool. So for those of you who really want things to be extra, extra clear, you can add parentheses. I would add a pair of parentheses from here to here, and then one more level from here to here, one more level from here to here, and then just you know, <laughs> one more level by itself for the zero itself. So that would really clearly indicate the level of recursion. So by the time you get to that zero, you would it would be nested in what five layers of your parentheses, but that is indicative of recursion as well because every time you call a function from itself, you are stacking one more call frame on top in the stack, and if you use GDB, you can actually see what we call the um, backtrace. Okay, if you use the command called backtrace or BT in GDB, you can actually see the multiple levels of the call you know, upon itself, the function calling itself. 
All right, so with that said and done, we are going to introduce the other big operators. But they are not really that much different. It's just the operator has changed and the identity value also has changed. So this is for multiplication. So for multiplication, we the default value is one because one is the identity of multiplication. X times one is X. Okay, so one is the identity of multiplication. If you have a big OR notation, then the default value is false because X OR false is X. So once again, the default value is really just the identity of whatever operator that I'm using to connect all the individual parts of the sequence. If the overall thing is an AND, then we are using true as the identity because you know, X AND true is X. So you can see the pattern here, right? You know, the, the pattern is whatever operator we choose to iterate to, uh, to connect all the individual components, uh, the default value when the indexes do not make sense or the begin and the end of the range does not make sense is just the identity. So that by adding that one more thing, by operating on that one more thing, would not change the value of everything else. So is that okay so far? Okay. So we do have something that is even more awkward, but now we have the tools to talk about it. <clears throat> so we have uh, existential. So we can now re-express existential statements using the big OR notation. So let's take a look at this one. Now this one on the left-hand side should be really familiar to you by now. In other words, if anyone is not feeling comfortable with this notation, you know, that person really kind of need to catch up with a lot of reading and practicing because, you know, we have been using quantifiers for a while. So this one says, you know, there exists at least one E in X such that F of E is true. Okay, that's basically what it means. So on the other side, we have something far more mechanical to express exactly the same thing. This is a big OR notation, but this time, instead of using B and E, to designate where we start and where we end as an index operator, we use this notation of E in X, which basically means for each element of X, we generate a term to be ORed together. But the actual term to be ORed is F of E. It is not E itself. It is some kind of predicate in this case you know, that we operate on E. Okay, so I'm gonna pause here and see if everybody can see can understand this particular statement where the mouse pointer is pointing to. We can pause a little bit, okay, if you need, if you need a little bit more time to digest this particular statement. <clears throat> yeah. This one? Okay, so I can, okay, let me show you an example. So I'm, I'm putting this all the way on top so I have room for an, you know, an example. So I'm going to go to my, I'm just going to use a text editor um, because, you know, I can still just, you know, kind of say or, or, okay, so there we go. All right, so let's just say that on the original expression is uh, there exists uh, E in, and I'll give you a specific set in this case. Um, two, seven, six, and ten. Okay, I don't really care. You know, these are just the values. And then, you know, inside the parentheses, such that, right, um, I'm going to say, you know, the F is, um, let's see, um, something is an odd number in this case. Okay, so we'll just say that E uh, mod two is a one. Okay, so let's say this is the original, which is false, right? because uh, two mod two is a zero, six mod two is a zero, 10 mod two is also a zero. So this quantified expression has a value of false, but that's not the point. The point is, how does that translate to the big OR notation? So if I want to translate this into the big OR notation, then it becomes um, the big OR, you know, where E is in two, six, 10. Um, okay, and then f of e is, you know, just e uh, mod 2 
is a one. So now, what, what does that mean, right? So what that means is uh, when E is two, which is, you know, quote unquote, the first element. Now I have to say in quotes, because, you know, any, everything in a set has no specific intrinsic order. So when I said the first one, I simply means the first one I choose to evaluate. Okay, you can always choose to evaluate 10 first or six first. It doesn't matter, should not matter. So in this case, it becomes, you know, two mod two is one or and then you choose the next one, which is six mod two is one, or uh, the last one is 10 mod two is one. That's what it's expanding to. Is that okay? So the, now the question is, do you see the equivalence between the left-hand side of the equal and the right-hand side of the equal? Do they seem to mean the same thing? One is just really verbose. The other one is like, oh, okay, this is a really concise way to say it. The other one is like, oh, when it's spelled out, that's what it becomes. Is that making any sense? Okay. So once again, we have a operator, which is the or, connecting terms that are generated by iterating something through, in this case, a set. So the only change this time is there's no ordering of items in a set. So I cannot use indexes anymore. I cannot say, oh, the index is going to start with zero and it's going to go to the cardinality of the set minus one. I cannot do that because there's no intrinsic way to order items within a set. That's the only difference. Is that okay? All right. So to people who go like, okay, I don't understand this notation. What does it mean when we have a big or notation, and then we say, you know, elements of X. Okay, so let's make this even more explicit. So what we're gonna do is we are going to pretend that we have a function uh, that would do a certain thing. So we are gonna create a notation called D of X. D is a function, and X is a set, okay? It can be any set that will, quote unquote, deterministically draw an element from a non-empty set X. So the only requirement for D to work is X is not empty, okay? But it will deterministically return exactly the same value every single time X is a particular set, okay? So that means, you know, this notation, which is the same as this notation here, which is all the way up here, is now becoming something that looks more like this, okay? So I will explain this one step by step. The first part, this is a ternary expression. This is the question mark. This is the false value, and this is the true value. So this means you know, if X is indeed the empty set, we are just going to return false, because false is the identity of or. Okay, we simply go like, okay, you know, if X is an empty set, then the default answer is false. I have no confirmation that you know, there's, there exists such a thing. Well, what if X is not an empty set? Well, if X is not an empty set, we apply this one here, okay? So we'll read this one step by step. The first one is, well, if X is not an empty set, I can always apply D of X to give myself one particular element in X. And someone is gonna say, but which element of X? I don't care, just one of them, okay? So if with one particular element of X, I can then apply the predicate F, which is gonna come back and say either true or false. Does that make sense? Because you know, the F is the original predicate that we operate on every single element anyway. So it's the same F, okay? This is not something new. And then we use an or operator here and say, uh, we're gonna evaluate the rest of the set using this thing here. Now, it looks a little busy, but the concept is exactly the same as what we did before. What we did before was to increment the beginning of the range of the values, right? There's no simple way to say this, so I have to use the difference operator here to basically say, well, since we already evaluated D of X, which is one particular element of X, I don't even care which one. We'll just say, except for that one, for the rest of X, we are gonna use this expression to evaluate you know, the, the you know, what the other elements have to say in this OR operation. 
So it's a, it's a, it's a little clumsy way to say that, but at the same time, as long as I have d of x defined, which is usually pretty easy, um, I now have a very mathematical and methodical way to express something that used to be, eh, okay, you know, that's existential quantifier, we kind of get it, but now it is very explicit of what it means. Is that, is, does that make any sense? Okay, so I can see that you know, some of the part of the difficulty of this sort of thing is the symbols. And there's no easy way to get around that you know, challenge other than use it. Okay, you know, just use it and try to practice using it you know, in your other classes. And the more you use it, the more you practice, the, the more uh, proficient you will become. It's just like any language that you're learning. Okay, if you want to learn, say, Italian or French or Japanese, okay, it's the same thing. Okay, you just have to read a lot of manga or watch a lot of Japanese anime, then you'll be good at Japanese in no time. <laughs> Except, you know, stuff like this is not nearly as much fun as watching, you know, Japanese anime. But if you're here, and computer science is what you want to study, I hope you know, you find a little bit of this interesting because otherwise you may not be in the, you, your, your, your choice of career and field of study may not be aligning, aligning with your interest and your aptitude. So, so there's that. Okay, so are we, are we good with this one? Now that we have talked about the existential quantifier, the next one is the universal quantifier, exactly. So the universal quantifier, if you look at this, this almost looks like the Morgan's Law, you know, where there's an opposite effect between ex existential versus universal, and one is an or, the other one is an and, okay? so. They are all connected, okay? All of these concepts are connected. Um, and then, you know, to figure out, you know, how to express the entire thing, the only thing you have to change, okay, two things. One is what is the identity. With or, the identity is false. With and, the identity is true. And also the connector or the connecting operator is a or in this case. After all, this is a big or you know, notation. And over here, we have a big and notation, and this is just an and notation here. Those are the only changes. So you can actually see the abstraction, okay? So the last part of this, which is the most, eh, I would say cryptic part of this, is this thing here, okay? You, you guys are asking, so Tack, did, did you use the wrong program to render the output of this thing and it just cannot find the, the correct symbol? No, I specifically chose a square as an operator because I want to leave the operator abstract. It's like, whatever operator. You go like, what? Well, yeah, whatever operator. So whatever operator, you know, for, I want to apply this operator to the result of all the f of e for every e in x. That's what it's saying, okay? So what is that equivalent to? Well, same thing, same structure. If the set that I'm operating on is an empty set, then return the identity of that operator. So I of the operator is returning the identity value of the operator. The identity of addition is zero. The identity of multiplication is one. The identity of or is false. The identity of conjunction is true, and so on and so forth. Okay, uh, what if X is not empty? Well, if X is not empty, I have at least one of these, or this is supposed to be uppercase X here. So I'm gonna pick N element out of X and go like, okay, we'll, we'll process that one to give us an actual value. And then we'll use the operator, whatever the operator is, to connect with this entire expression here. You go like, but isn't that expression the same thing as what we started off with? Almost, okay. It is everything in X other than the value that we have chosen to use here. 
So that's the abstract version of all the things that we have been talking about. Which means it can now be applied to other operators, because all we need is the operator to have an identity value. If I have that, I'll be fine. Okay, okay. Let me take that back. Two requirements. The first requirement is it has to be a binary operator, so that I can connect two values and give me a particular value. It has to be a binary operator. Two, the operator has to have a identity value. Okay. So now I look at this and go like, so can we do this with union? Because union is an operator, right? Is an operator that applies to sets and it returns a set as a result of the operation. So the question is, can we apply that to a union? I go like, yeah, sure. So if you want to union, okay, use the set union operator and f of e better return a set, okay, some kind of set based on e. If I want to do a union of all the f of e and e being an element of x, then I apply the same structure here. If x is empty, give me the identity of union. The identity of union is the empty set. Because if you union with an empty, if x is a set and is unioned with an empty set, what do you get? x, the original set, right? So this is the identity. If not, if x is not empty, then I got this thing here, which is basically just following the structure that we have been talking about already. All right, so are we doing okay or not? Go ahead. So intersection does not have an identity because it depends, because the only identity you can use with intersection is whatever set is you're intersecting with. So it, it's not a constant that you can intersect with that will give you the same thing all the time. You can, yeah. Um, negation has no, negation falls, you know, fails, you know, both requirements because negation is not a binary operator and as such, you know, it does not have an identity. Um, there may be other operators that do not have an identity. I don't know, okay? Uh, but all the common ones that we use, you know, do have, you know, a, um, an identity value. And if you are also a math major, you know, you're going to have to study a class, you're going to have to take a class called abstract algebra. And this is kind of like that, okay? You know, you're basically taking things up a level and just abstract out the operator itself. You just say that, okay, this operator only needs to have these properties in order for all of these things to work. So, you know, that's basically what abstract algebra is about. All right, so section three is, you know, me justifying the waste of the last half hour or so <clears throat> of, you know, is this really necessary? I mean, you know, what kind of person would talk about these things, you know, at this level? Well, okay, there are two reasons, okay? Well, at the time I could think of two reasons, maybe there are more now. The first reason is that there's no better way to explain the summation or the sigma notation or any one of the other operators. Because, you know, you can show examples, but those are not exact, okay? This kind of definition is very exact, okay? It's very precise. When do we stop? Where do we start, okay? What do we do if the range does not make any sense, okay? So it is very, very precise. Um, okay, the recursive definition only relies on existing operators, you know, like addition, uh, multiplication, conjunction, disjunction, union, okay? And or, okay? Oh, okay, I said that already, conjunction, disjunction. And the very same definition, you know, being defined, the key is the base cases where the summation returns the identity, the identity of addition you know, as an operator, which in this case is a zero, okay? <clears throat> so earlier, um, somebody mentioned, is there an identity for the intersection? And I said there's none. Well, I lied. <laughs> there is a, uh, just like there's the set empty set, you can imagine there is a set that includes everything. It's called a universe. 
I mean, literally, it's called a universe. Okay, so when you think about the universe as a set, okay, it's obviously it's theoretical. You cannot write it out. Then it is the identity of intersection, because a set intersect intersecting with everything is just that original set. So in that sense, okay, the universe set is the identity of intersection. So just to make sure that I am not talking about, yep. Yeah, but but we want the identity to be a specific value. It cannot be dependent on the first thing that you're intersecting. So we'll I'll do a quick search, okay, just to make sure that I'm not high on coffee right now, which I am. Um, so we'll ask identity value of intersection. <clears throat> nope, nope, nope. That's not what I'm looking for. Uh, set operation. So we have to give it a little bit more context. Uh, okay, let's give it even more. Uh, da, 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 da. Nope. Well, they don't talk about this, but I'm just going to say that if you know we have to call out a identity for intersection, it would be the quote unquote universe set, which includes everything. Hmm? Yeah, yeah, I did. <clears throat> But I don't think you know, huh? The, um, I okay. Let's try that. Identity intersection set operator. Okay. List of set identities. Okay, so let's find intersection. They do mention the universe set, so I think that's basically it. Yep. Huh? Oh, I'm pretty sure there is, <laughs> because mathematicians like um, symbols. Uh, double complement, two set involved. Okay, let me just look for identity, identity. There we go. I'm guessing X is the symbol for the, uni the uh, u universe set. And then the uh, this is the empty set. There we go, yep. The universe is X in this uh, wiki page. Yep, so so that just confirmed that uh, what I said was not a, <laughs> it's not loony. Well, just because of the few last minutes was not a loony does not mean that the rest of my lectures are not loony. So once again, I'm using quantifiers, right? You know, that's how you use it, okay? You just basically have to, Think about what we are talking about. Are we talking about specifics or are we talking about general? All right, so that's the, you know, that's that. Uh, in other words, okay, the second paragraph, this recursive definition of summation is concise, it is complete, and also sound because it has to meet all three requirements for it to be useful. The second reason is this is a good example of recursive definition. The non-recursive definition itself is intuitive to people, but not to machines, okay? And most people do not use a recursive definition, but this is why it's a good example to teach the use of recursive definitions. All right, any questions, comments, feedback? Nope, okay. So. I'm hoping that when you read something like this, 
you're not just reading this as completely a standalone concept. It's like, okay, you know, in text class, we need to know about this. This relates to your other classes too, okay? It relates, it should relate to your 430 class, okay? Because your 430, CISP 430 class deals with a lot of recursive definitions. So this is a application. This is one application of recursive definitions. But more importantly, it is about how do you formulate recursive definitions. You basically go like, okay, where is my base case? In other words, when can I always give a really easy answer? Go like, it's going to be this, okay? Well, in this case, if the set is empty, okay, I'm going to give you a quick answer. The quick, the question is, what quick answer should I give, okay, in order for the whole thing to work? That takes a little bit of thinking, but that's how you construct recursive definitions. Is you always think about when do I stop, okay? You know, when can I give a specific answer right away? That's basically the question. All right, so with this said, okay, this is actually necessary to do today's class. You know, I just reminded myself that. Then we can move on and talk about the, the rest of counting. So the counting module is already up. It is module 305. So we'll start with you know, some terms, okay? You know, simple terms. Uh, we'll start with the term of what a trial is. So a trial is a single attempt to do something, typically involving, you know, in this case, you're choosing something. Um, a single choice is a trial. So I can give you several examples. So if I give you a bag of marbles, okay, and each marble is numbered, okay? So let's say we have 20 marbles in the bag and I ask you to pull five marbles out of the bag, but one by one, okay? So you cannot just kind of get your hand in the bag and grab a bunch, okay? So you, you have to pick out the marbles one by one. Each marble, each time you take one marble out of the bag, it is a trial, okay? Another example, flipping a coin, okay? So every time you flip a coin and you know, it lands and it will either be head or tail, that is a trial. In the case of um, you know networking, okay, when you're transmitting individual bits over Wi-Fi, over Ethernet, and or whatnot, each reception of the a bit is an event or can be considered as a, as an event. Okay, so excuse me, not an event, but a trial. Okay, a trial. So a trial is basically one particular action or attempt or it to to do something, and associated with each trial, okay, moving on to the next paragraph, a trial has a set of possible outcomes. So what the outcomes are, it really depends on what the trial is. So in the case of you know, drawing marbles out of a bag, it depends on which trial too, because the first trial is gonna say, oh, the, the marble that I took, that, I, that I'm taking out of the bag, can be any one of the original 20 marbles. That's the first trial. The second trial only has 19 remaining marbles. The third trial only has 18 remaining you know, marbles and so on. But in the case of flipping a coin or throwing a dice, okay, the outcome set remains unchanged. It, not, it does not depend on you know, what happened in prior you know, trials. So if you flip a coin, you know, the next coin flip, it's gonna have two possible outcomes, head or tail. Well, what if you have your know, 20 heads in a, in a row? The next one can still be a head. You cannot rule out that the next one is gonna be a head. Does that make sense? Okay. So we have trials. We have you know, the outcome of a single trial. But then what is an experiment? An experiment is a series of trials. So. Note that I use the word series instead of a bunch or a set or something like that, because a series implies there's a certain sequence to it. In other words, which trial we are talking about is important. Okay, you know where is that trial in the entire sequence is can be significant. Okay, so you can you can if you don't like the word series, you can change it to sequence if you want, or an array. So an experiment is an array of trials where subsequent trials may be affected by earlier ones. 
So in the case of you know, just you know, picking a marble out of a bag without putting that back into the bag, then the earlier trials definitely would impact the outcome of later trials. Does that make sense? Okay, all right. Um, and an experiment has its own outcomes. So the outcome of, and of an experiment is by default going to be an array because each trial in the experiment gives you a particular value. And because we are talking about a sequence of you know, trials, so that means ordering is important. So that means you know, the outcome of the entire experiment is an array or twofold of the individual outcomes of each individual trial. Is that okay? All right. <clears throat> In general, the outcome set of an experiment is represented by the Greek symbol omega, not to be confused with the set of operators in propositional calculus. Because there are only so many symbols, so we do recycle symbols. So in this context, omega means the outcome set of an experiment, not of an individual trial. Are we good so far? Okay. So these are terms that we are, that kind, that's kind of abstract. So instead of just you know, referring to these abstract terms, we are going to eh, take a look at a few actual examples. So let me switch to the tablet screen, which is super note. There we go. And we want to maximize. There we go. Excellent. All right. So in the case of flipping a coin, okay? So in the case of flipping a coin, we start with you know, nothing. This is before the first trial. So the first trial is going to give us two possible outcomes because it can either be a head or a tail. The second experiment, okay, the second trial, if the first one is a head, the second trial can still be a head or a tail because we just talked about this earlier. And if the first trial has a tail, the second trial can also be a head or a tail. What about the third trial? <laughs> kind of the same deal, right? So the fan out is always going to be two because you know, an earlier trial does not have any impact on these you know, later trials. So we have head, tail here, and also have head, tail over here. So the question is, um, then what is omega in this case? Let's just say that we have you know, three trials in the experiment. Then what is omega? So in this case, omega is going to be a set. It can be head, 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 tail, head, tail, head, head, tail, 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 head, head. I mean, you guys know the drill already. Just look at head as zero and look at tail as one. This is a sequence of binary numbers in order. And the last one is tail, 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 which is seven, one, one, one. Okay, so that's the outcome set of this particular experiment. Each trial of this experiment is flipping a coin. Do we have any questions about this particular example? Nope, okay, all right. So let's move on to the second example. So in the second example, okay, come on. There we go. Okay, so in the second example, uh, we're gonna have a little bag here, okay? And the bag has, let's say three marbles. Uh, we have marble A, marble B, and marble C, okay? And I want to pick two marbles out of the bag and you know, so each trial is taking one marble out of the bag. So the first trial, there are three possible outcomes because I can pick A, B, or C out of the bag. But since I'm not putting the marble back into the bag, the second trial now is I need to be careful because A is already out in this path. So the second marble can either be a B or a C. It cannot be A again. With this one, the second marble can be an A or a C, but it cannot be B again. And then for this one, you know, the, the second marble can either be an A or B, but it cannot be C again. 
So in this case, omega, which is representing the outcome set of the entire experiment, which means you know, combining the two trials, it would be, you know, if I, I just don't want to have to use the, um, the parentheses, you know, because it just takes a lot of time. So I have A, B, A, C, B, A, B, C, C, A, and C, oops, C, B. So it has six elements in the outcome set. This is the outcome of the ex experiment. Yes? Because order is important. But what I'm saying is the order is important. A, C is That is correct. Yep. It is always better to come up with the permutations first because we know how to you know, uh, count for duplicate because one single combination can generate um, permutations, but we know, you know how to count, account for the duplicate permutations. So if you start with permutations, then and later on you find out that, oh, okay, things can be in any particular order, you just have to divide you know, that particular number by the number of permutations per combination, and you have the answer. But there are also cases where ordering itself is important. All right, so are we good so far with these two examples of experiments? Okay, they represent the two main types of experiments that we are gonna deal with in this class. Okay, you can see one, the first one. The first one is actually interesting in many ways. Okay, so let me go back to the first one first. Yeah, this one. So this one is interesting in many ways, one, is regardless of the previous trials, the outcome per trial remains the same all the time. Then you guys can say, oh, flipping a coin is the same, but so is throwing a dice, right? So you know, if you have a six-faced dice, then the fan-out ratio just becomes six instead of two, but it is the same. It's constant you know, for each level of the tree. So what makes this one any more special than that one? Well, what makes this one even more special is it is binary. There are only two outcomes per trial. Okay, so later on we'll talk about why this one is a little bit special because it is also a binomial distribution. It relates to the binomial distribution. In other words, if we know, you know prior you know, what is the probability of a head and what is the probability of a tail, I can actually tell you what is the likelihood of ending up with two tails and a head where the ordering is not important? Okay, I can model that with things that we already understand in algebra. So we'll talk about that one in you know, maybe another class. You know, I don't think we have enough time today to talk about that one. So uh, do we have any questions up to this point? Nope, okay, all right. So then we move on and talk about general counting. So the question is, you know, we keep saying, we, we keep referring to the term counting. What exactly are we counting? Well, we are basically counting the number of unique lotto tickets, that sort of thing. How many ways can we blah, 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 okay? But why is that important, especially in computer science? You know, it sounds like we are in a math class right now, and, all I want to do is to do some game programming. I don't want to learn math, which is not possible, right? You know, becoming a game programmer without an understanding math is just not possible, period. I don't care what other people have to say, just impossible, okay? So what kind of counting are we talking about? We're counting the number of ways to X, Y, and Z, okay? So why is that important? Okay, so I'm just gonna pause here a little bit and talk about why counting is an important subject. The number of ways to whatever. Why is that important? Okay, I, I can give you an example. <clears throat> so I use this example in multiple classes, but I think this is also a good way to, it's a good place to use that example. So let's say you're working for a pizza shop, okay, and you are the person who is driving and delivering the pizzas, okay? So the, the question is, okay, 
how many stops do you think is appropriate when you are delivering pizzas? Has anyone worked as a pizza delivery person? No one. You guys are so lucky. Can anyone give it give it a guess? Three. You're probably like you're some low single digit number, okay? Because if it's a high number, you know the later pizzas will be cold, right? You know, and people don't like their pizza cold. So let's say it is up to five, okay? Up to up to you as a delivery person, you can be delivering up to five stops, okay? So you're working for this pizza delivery shop, and um, the previous employee, the previous driver, has gotten a lot of complaints, you know, because you know the route is chosen poorly. So the last you know, two pizzas usually will get cold, and then the company, the pizza place, has to, you know, actually you know, pay for the pizza and actually apologize and do all kinds of stuff like that. So you go like, oh, I'm a computer science person. I'm just delivering pizza because I cannot find a job right now. Remember that 7.8 percent of unemployment rate. Yeah, yeah. So you're just delivering pizza because I cannot find a job, and I still have to figure out a way to pay my student loan back. So you. Deliver pizza. So you go like, okay, it's a good time for me to apply what I have learned. With five you know, stops, hmm, I can just enumerate every single possible route. Okay, so how many routes do you have when you need to deliver five pizzas? There are five stops, A, B, C, D, E. Okay, come on, you guys learned this from last, last Wednesday. Okay, how many choices do you have for the first five. stop? So, and then after that, how many choices do you have for your second stop? Four, three, two, one. Five times four times three times two times one. Why am I multiplying and not adding? Think of it from the tree perspective, right? So the first level has a fan out of five. The second level has a fan out of four, three, two, and then one. So that's why you're multiplying. So how many leaves do you have in that particular tree? Five times four times three times two, basically, you know, 120, right? So you go like, okay, I have 120 possible ways to traverse the five stops, okay? And I know the API to Google Maps, okay? So I can actually, you know, use my app here to figure out, okay, if I do it this way, you know, it's going to take me this much time, you know, like from start to stop. If I do it this way, it's going to take me this much, this much time from start to stop. So I can optimize. Okay. So do you think 120 is doable when it is a script doing it? Yeah, I would say 120 is completely doable using a script. Okay. It might take Google, you know, with your interaction with Google, it might take, you know, the, the app what, five seconds, 10 seconds to solve you know, the entire thing. So you always end up with the best route. So your employee, your, your boss is totally impressed, give you a raise. Well, I see that you have a student loan to pay. I'm gonna you know, raise your salary by you know, 20% so you can pay off that loan a little bit faster. So instead of paying off that loan you know, in 25 years, it would be that 22 years now. <clears throat> so, so you get that raise, and you've been using the computer, the program for a while, and then one day you come to work, your boss just tells you, you're fired. I don't care about your student loan, okay, or how long it's gonna take you to pay off the student loan, you know, you're fired. You go like, what? I've been doing a great job, you know, doing this, you know, delivery thing. Your boss said, you embarrass me. You're like, what? What did I do? So your boss then explains and go like, you know, I got this friend, you're working for a, delivery truck, you know, company, you know, online merchant thing. And I said, you know, this is a great program. Use it. You know, your driver will know exactly what is the best way to deliver everything. And your program didn't work. You go like, no, no, no. I've been using this program like several times a day. I know it works. Your boss says, no, no, it doesn't, it doesn't work. How is it not working? Did it, did it crash or something? No, it just does not come back with an answer. You go like, that's not normal. And then you go like, wait, how many stops does each truck have? Okay, so you guys can tell me. What do, what do you think of a, how many stops do you think an Amazon, typical Amazon truck, the one with a 
with the actual logo, how many stops do they have? Five? <laughs> Try maybe a hundred, okay? So you go like, okay, maybe it has a hundred stops. Then your boss goes like, so if your program is taking 10 seconds for five stops, and these guys are having a hundred stops, let's just say it's hundred, okay, which is 20 times five, right? So you go like, okay, so it's it, at the worst, okay, it will only like take 20 times the amount of time that I see you doing on your computer. You go like, no boss, it's not 20 times. The boss goes like, what do you mean by it's not 20 times? 100 divided by five is 20. I can do this math. One dollar has 20, uh, what, nickels, right? Your boss says, I can deal with that. I can deal with that level of math. You go like, no, 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 no. It's a little more than that. Why? Because it's 100 factorial. You learn that from counting how many ways do we have to do blah, blah, blah. Because in the case of 100 stops, the first choice, there's a 100 fan out. And then you have 99, 98, 97, and all the way down to one. So the question is, what is 100 factorial? How does that compare to five factorial? So let's do that, okay? You know, this is the kind of stuff that is easy to do with a spreadsheet, and um, Google Sheets is great for this. I can just delete the document later. So we'll say new Google Sheets. And what we want to do is to find out what is 100 factorial. So we say factorial of 100. <laughs> That's 100 factorial. And we already know the other one, okay? So we are dealing with the factorial of five here, okay? And we want to find out the ratio between these two. This thing divided by that thing doesn't help very much, does it? <clears throat> So <laughs> we are looking at 7.777 blah, 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 times 10 to the power of 155 zeros. Yes, that's why your program seems to be hung, because it's, it, it will take a long time to evaluate every single possible one. This is why this class is useful, okay? Because it gives you the tools to evaluate time complexity, okay? Now, this problem, by the way, is called, this is a very classic problem, it's called the traveling salesman problem, okay? So you can look it up. I did not invent this. This has been a big problem, you know, since the beginning of computer science. So just look up traveling salesman, or salesperson these days, your problem. And it's a very well-known problem. It is the poster child of an entire classification of problems to solve. It is called MP-complete. So MP-complete describes a class of problems where the problems can be transformed within each other, within that entire set, using what we call a polynomial time algorithm. In other words, if you're trying to optimize the use of registers in a compiler, okay, for those of you who have taken CISP 310, you understand, oh, okay, I wish there were more registers so I don't have to keep swapping things between memory and the registers. Yeah, registers are useful. So if you want to optimize the use of registers, it becomes a traveling salesman problem. It is a, what we call an MP complete problem. And for those of you who really cannot wait and go like, what does that mean? What is MP? What does MP represent? N stands for non-deterministic, and P stands for polynomial. So NP complete really just says non-deterministic polynomial time. Then what does that mean? It means if you have an infinite number of threads all executing uh, a program at the same time, it will still it will take polynomial time. Okay, so NP complete means you know given an unlimited number of parallel threads of execution, it will take polynomial time. So are there algorithms worse than MP-complete? 
Yeah. But they are typically not as practical. There are a lot of practical problems that we want to solve, and they are MP-complete. Are we good so far? Okay. So this is way ahead in your future. Okay. You know, some of you can, you know, there may be some universities, some programs where you can kind of <laughs> swerve around your know, classes, you know, that talk about MP-completeness. I would not. Okay, I will not swerve around the, these classes because I think these are really solid foundational classes that that really makes your computer science degree worth its you know money. Okay, um, so anyway, this is and one application of counting, um, figuring out the number of unique lotto tickets. Yeah, it's kind of fun, you know, but it is an application. Okay. Um, so this class, you know, when everybody's here, I'm not taking a row today, um, we have about 50, uh, 30, maybe 32, 33 people. So if I ask, what is the likelihood that at least two people in this class share the same birth date, excluding the year, what do you think it's going to be? So this is another application of, you know, um, counting. So let's focus on that one, okay? That one is actually, you can find it in Wikipedia as well. It's called the birthday problem. It's, sim it's simply called the birthday problem. Birthday problem. But let's, let's tackle this one, okay? Because it's a way of thinking. I want to show you the way of thinking here. So I don't have to really give you the spreadsheet. You know, there's a graph here already. This is the number of people. This is the probability that at least two people share the same birth date, okay? You go like, yeah, if there's very few people in the class, you know, the probability is pretty low. But you can kind of see that by the time you get to 23, it's already 0.5. There's a 50% chance that at least two people in the class share the same birth date. This, is, this class has more than 23 people, at least at this point, maybe after the second exam. Then we'll be, the number will change, okay? I'm not looking forward to having that number change, but I'm just saying. Okay, so this class has a higher, more than one half of a chance that at least two people in this class share the same birth date. Intuitively, it does not make sense. It, it really doesn't, doesn't make sense. Let's just say that we have 30 people. Let's say we have 36 people, okay, to be exact. There are 360 days in the year, right? So you go like, okay, so maybe it's a, it's point 0.1 of a probability because you know 36 divided by 365 is kind of point 0.1, right? I mean that's what that's how most people would think about it. But 36 is sort of you know somewhere between 30, you know, right in the middle of 30 and 34. It's already up here. Uh, so we are looking at somewhere between 0.7 and 0.8. That doesn't seem to make sense, right? So when things do not seem to make sense, you have to resort to math, okay? You have to resort to rigor in logical thinking, okay? So why is it like that? Okay, so how do we formulate this problem? We already understand enough to deal with this problem. So let's go ahead and see if we can apply what we have learned to solve this problem. What is the probability that at least two people have the same birth date in a class of n people. So how do we how do we attack that problem? How do we look at this problem and go like, okay, where do we start? Okay, so I'll give you guys a little bit of time as I fiddle with my tablet here. Find an empty page. There we go. Okay. So let's take a look at the problem. So instead of asking that probability, I'm going to change the question and ask the opposite, which is, in a class of n people, what are the chances that there are, there's no duplicate birth dates? Everybody has a unique birth date, okay? Which is one minus the other probability. Does that make sense? Okay, so I'll just write it down. So I'm going to say, what is the probability of no one sharing the same birth date 
in a class of, well, let's give it an actual concrete number, five people. Okay, that's the question. You go like, okay, with five people, we can kind of work this out, okay? So the other way to say this, okay, if I were to say no one sharing the same birth date, unique birth dates. Does that work for you? Do you think it means about the same thing? Okay, all right. So now you look at this problem and go like, oh, that's still pretty hard, but tax says that this has something to do with counting the number of ways to blah, blah, blah. Okay, so let's see what kind of counting the way of doing something that we have encountered, okay? Yes, go ahead. Nope, nope, no, not quite, okay? That's why I keep the number low because you know, this way we can kind of visualize the problem. Yes? Not exactly the same, okay? So it is more like you have a huge, gigantic bag of marbles, 250, 365 to be exact. So you got this huge you know, bag of marble, and then you have five people in the class each person walks up to that bag and say, I'm gonna take one marble out of the bag. The next person do the same thing, the next person do the same thing, and so on. Because we are not putting the marbles back in the bag, so the five marbles are guaranteed unique, right? So now we are asking, basically we are asking, how many ways can we choose five marbles out of 365? So that, solves one problem, okay? Because you know, each, ex each trial of this experiment is picking one marble out of the bag of whatever marble is left. And it starts with 365 marbles, except for this year, we have 366. <laughs> but for the sake of you know, just working out the number, we'll say 365, okay? So the next question is, is ordering important? Well, it, is, it's, it doesn't seem to be important, but it is important because if I ask the number of permutations, then the ordering is important, right? If I ask about the number of combinations, then the ordering is not important, okay? So we know how to work out the number of permutations and we know how to work out the number of combinations. The question is, what are you doing with that number, okay? Because that number by itself doesn't give you probability. It just says, oh, we got this many ways of choosing five dates out of a year, five unique dates out of a year. So to be, so let's make it more concrete, okay? To make it more concrete, I am going back to the, where's my spreadsheet? Hmm. I think it's this one. Yep, there we go. All right, so now we just look at the number because I think it's better to actually look at the number. So in terms of combination, we got this many. And then in terms of permutations, it is, eh, it's, a little, it's 120 times that number, basically. Okay, there we go. So we got these two numbers. The question is, what are you gonna do with that number? You taking the reciprocal of this number, doesn't seem to make sense, right? So you're basically asking, what if there's no restriction? I got five people in the class, there's no restriction. Everybody can pick any one day out of the, out of the year. Then how many ways can we arrange that? Exactly, okay. So now we got these two, and we got a third number, which is a power. So we have 365 to the power of five, which is saying if there's no restriction and anyone can pick any one of the 365 days in a year, we end up with this many ways of choosing five dates out of a year, but there can be duplicates. You can have weird duplicates, like you know, two are the same, two are the same, and then one is not the same as the other, you know, four and so on, okay? 
This includes every single possible way. Is that okay? So the question now is, um, so how do we get the probability that you, we end up with unique dates, okay? Five unique uh, dates of five people in the class not sharing the same birthday. So let me ask you this question. When I'm considering this number, the fan out, okay, let's, let's look at it from the perspective of the tree. So this is you know, why you know, trees are important because trees are intrinsically ordered, okay? You know, because it has got layers, right? So let's just say that a year has four days, okay? Strange planet, but that's the case. So if, a, if, it's, if on this planet each year only has four days, then if I have no restrictions, then the fan out is going to be four for all levels. Does that make sense? Right? So by the time you get to the leaf node, then you have you know, all the possible ways of um, each person having a specific birth date in that year. So let's say this is for person A and this is for person B, right? So when you look at each of these you know, leaf nodes here, then it is representing you know, all the different ways that A and B can have their birth dates with no restrictions. So ordering is important here because you know, um, one, one, uh, excuse me, one, two, and two, one would be on two different nodes. It'll be counted as two entries. Does that make sense? Okay. So if, the, if this is you know, order dependent, then you should probably use permutations or the number of permutations instead of the number of combinations because your denominator is order dependent. Then your numerator should be order dependent as well. So that means <clears throat> in this case, if I go back to the spreadsheet, so that means in this case for five people only, then the chances of having five unique birth dates, there are no duplicates, is this number here, which is a pretty high chance. Does it make sense to you? With only five people and there are 365 days in the year, the chances of you know, the five people have all having unique birth dates is a pretty high ratio. Okay, that seems to make sense, right? So now we look at the next one. We go like, okay, so I'm going to use this column here for n, which is the number of people in class. Okay, this is one, and we'll just kind of, ah, we can work it out later. Um, so in this case, we have the number of permutations. So 365 days, you know, we are picking this number of dates out of that year. And then we have the power, okay, 365 to the power of this number here. And then we have the probability, which is just this number divided by this number here. That's the probability. So eh, I think this makes sense. If there's only one person in class, we know for sure that birth date has to be unique. Okay. Not only does it make sense intuitively, it makes sense numerically as well. Okay, so this equation works. So now we say, what if there are two people? So which is this number just plus one. Now the best thing about the spreadsheet is I can just do this. That's pretty easy. Then you have a 99.7 chance, 99.7% uh, chance that these two, these two people do not share the same birth date. You go like, yeah, that sounds pretty good, you know, because there are 250, 265 days in the year, so the chances of both of them on the same day, pretty low. So, so we, we can kind of get a sense that these um, <clears throat> formulae are working. So now we work it up to 23, right? Because, you know, not, not, no, no, we, we, we didn't start with row one, so we have to go a little bit further to get to 23. So 23 is kind of crossing over and it becomes you know, less than one half of a chance. Okay, so that's what, the, what, that's what Wikipedia is trying to tell you. It's like, this is the break even, okay? At this point, we have 50% chance-ish, you know, that the class would have um, uh, duplicate birth dates, you know, in the, in the, in the class. 
So we're going to work this out a little bit more. I know it's time for us to leave. So by the time we get to 30, it's only 29% that we end up with 30 unique birth dates, which means there's a 70% chance that at least two people in the class share the same birth date. So this is you know, another application of counting. Okay, because you know, if you are the organizer, if you are the sunshine person in the class and you're always the one you're know, arranging for birthday parties and you know, double birthdays, you'll know, get special treatment and you're in charge of the budget, I think this is useful because you can now go like, so what are the chances that I have to do a you know, double birthday you know, or double you know, birthday you know, celebration? When you have a larger class, that chance goes way up. So you have to collect more money from the rest of the class. <laughs> All right, so this is it for today. Okay, so keep reading that module. Okay, so I'm gonna interleave here the lecture with examples and stuff like that, just so that it's not as dry. But it's also hopefully you're know, connecting the concepts to something you go you can you can get your hands on. It's like oh yeah, I can totally draw that your know, graph or the tree and or whatnot. All right, I'll see you on Wednesday. And the next exam should be getting close because this is week 10-ish already, so. <clears throat>